Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a discussion about uh, how the use of evidence is evolving in the U.S. to uh, establish price and access to medicines. I'm joined today by Amitabh Chandra and Darius Lakdawala, and in just a moment, I will ask them to introduce themselves. I also want to state up front that in addition to being a visiting scholar with the American Enterprise Institute, I am also a consultant to biopharmaceutical companies. So uh, if I could start off with Darius, if you want to introduce yourself, but also share a sentence or two about your connection to this topic of uh, the use of evidence to establish price or access for medicines or other healthcare. Sure, happy to. Thanks, Kirsten, and thanks for having me. My name is Darius Lakdawala. I'm a professor at USD. You can see my office building behind me there. Um, and I'm a health economist and the director of research at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Um, I also am a consultant to the biopharmaceutical industry. I'm the chief scientific officer at Entity Risk, which provides analytics to uh, firms in this space. And actually, in many ways, it was through my um, partnership and, and working with industry that uh, I was exposed to a lot of the issues and vagaries around this issue of evidence development, evidence use, and price setting. Um, and I think one of the uh, momentous questions facing us today in the wake of the IRA is how will prices be determined in the United States with heavier government involvement and what's the appropriate role for evidence of value and effectiveness? Thank you. Amata? Thank you for inviting me, um, Kirsten, and it's just great to be here with you and Darius. Uh, I'm Amitabh Chandra. I'm an economist. I'm a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and also at Harvard Business School. Um, I have a longstanding interest in, in, in this topic that comes from research that I've done over the past 15 years on the effects of cost sharing on patients' health and the extent to which health plans actually use evidence in designing their formularies. And by way of um, conflicts, I mean, you should know that I have been involved in litigation consulting where I've represented manufacturers and I've also represented health plans. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'm going to ask you both a series of questions, but before I do that, I'm just gonna share a few minutes worth of slides to kind of set up some of the discussion topics we'll be covering today. And we're gonna focus on three somewhat recent developments, uh, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, which Darius already uh, raised in his opening comments, the use of coverage with evidence development in Medicare, but related to medicines, um, and the growth of state drug review boards. And we'll really be considering how evidence is going to be used in the future to set price in the US, um, different from how it is today, and what are the implications for the development of clinical evidence, both for new drugs and for uh, latter indications um, or additional uh, post-market study. Um, so, uh, you know, there's basically three, three sort of fairly momentous changes in policy that we that are being implemented uh, really currently. The Inflation Reduction Act will allow the federal government to set the price of certain drugs in Medicare, and they may consider uh, clinical value of the medication and comparative uh, effectiveness. Um, coverage with evidence development um, has been used for uh, a number of years, for decades, actually, um, to permit the use of certain treatments in Medicare, permit the coverage, so being paid for in Medicare uh, for certain treatments, but only in the context of a study to collect evidence. It's a way to uh, sort of limit access to a uh, therapeutic where there are some questions about it um, as until more data is collected. And um, the, the coverage with evidence development uh, process can be lifted once additional um, evidence is collected. And then finally, states are increasingly um, setting up state drug review boards that evaluate, um, among other things, uh, cost and value of the medicines and uh, may set uh, price and access based on um, those findings. So, you know, why are we doing this? Um, why, why do we think that policy has been headed in this direction? I mean, you know, certainly we're living longer and better because of medicine, but that has a cost. And um, when we consider policy, uh, particularly at the federal level, 
um, prevention, stopping disease, longevity doesn't really count in the short term as saving money um, and certainly doesn't count past uh, 10 years in the way that uh, sort of budget forecasts are developed when considering a new piece of legislation. Uh, it's well recognized that drug revenue and investment um, in new drugs are positive related, but that's just become really a less compelling argument under the pressure to save, uh, even when there is maybe broad recognition that certain medicines may be worth it, um, there's still additional pressure to offer additional discounts or bring down the price. Um, and finally, there's been really a lot of uh, in, uh, critique um, and notice that uh, drug prices in the US are much higher than they are in other countries. So, you know, we're seeing increasing interest in using some of the techniques that are used in other countries to set price in order to bring costs down closer to those uh, to those other countries. Uh, certainly the use of evidence to set price and access has both its fans and detractors among the patient, provider, um, and policymaker community. And economists. Um, so really kind of one of, the, one of the bigger changes in the US is that we're moving in uh, Medicare from a system where the drug prices net of discounts were negotiated between private insurers and drug companies. Now CMS will be permitted to select uh, the largest drugs um, and an increasing number over time and set uh, the price, a maximum price uh, for those drugs and additional discounts may be offered beyond that. Um, uh, CED, uh, Coverage with Evidence Development, was used recently to uh, restrict access within the context of clinical study for uh, approved FDA-approved monoclonal antibodies against Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, the state drug review boards um, do include elements of uh, reviewing evidence of value relative to the cost of the medicine, and they can establish an upper price limit for drugs which are in their focus. So that includes things like state employees, uh, incarcerated people, university employees. Um, the price can be set um, by those boards as the maximum price. Um, so the way the Inflation Reduction Act is going to uh, potentially uh, use evidence is the government will select the drugs and the factors they make in, may consider include clinical value and comparative effectiveness to, relative to other treatments, along with other uh, factors such as how much the drug is discounted currently, how much was invested in its R&D. Um, they will offer a price to the biopharmaceutical company, which the biopharmaceutical company can take or leave. Um, they cannot leave the negotiation, I'm sorry, the, the biopharmaceutical company can take or push back, um, but CMS is not obligated to change their price if the drug company offers a different price. They cannot take or leave the price uh, without facing a uh, heavy penalty. And then those drugs where the prices are set, um, that will be the maximum fair price that is uh, permitted in Medicare. And again, the health plans can ask for additional discounts beyond that price. Outside organizations could also be relied on their reports or directly to, um, to support uh, CMS in the process of price setting in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, uh, in terms of coverage of evidence development, uh, in fairly new territory was the recent decision to limit uh, the use of an FDA-approved drug uh, with CED. It was a drug that was approved on a surrogate endpoint um, for Alzheimer's disease via the reduction of amyloid plaque. Um, there have been 27 coverage decisions since 2005. This was the first for an on-label drug use. Um, there has been uh, others for off-label drug uses for cancer. Um, the coverage decision basically says if the drug is approved based on a surrogate endpoint, such as the one that was approved, it will only be covered um, in the context of a randomized clinical trial that is approved. If it's based on a direct measure of efficacy, um, such as you know, cognition um, or ability to do certain activities of daily living, then it can be used and um, covered in the context of a registry, which is uh, typically less uh, less less designed, uh, well, it's more of a real world type application uh, relative to a clinical trial. Um, so this creates sort of a new level of uncertainty. Well, actually that's something I'm gonna ask the two of you. Uh, this could create a new level of uncertainty for biopharma manufacturers who are investing for uh, in clinical study for new drugs or post-market indications, particularly because this coverage decision applied to sort of all drugs in a class, um, some that haven't been approved yet. Um, and, uh, you know, leave sort of the questions open about what, how much and what evidence is needed. 
Um, and you know, going forward, will this sort of affect uh, how we think about surrogate markers and the ability to get a drug uh, covered if it's approved on a surrogate marker? Surrogate endpoints, just very quickly, uh, surrogate endpoints are like blood pressure, cholesterol. They don't directly, uh, you don't directly measure a heart attack or a cardiac event with certain medicines because uh, it would take so long to for the cholesterol reduction to actually show that there was a cardiac event. Um, so surrogate endpoints are well established. Many drugs are approved by the FDA based on a surrogate endpoint, both in rapid review and in regular review. And surrogate endpoints are, in fact, um, published by the FDA. And uh, post-market studies may or may not be required to follow on and see if the surrogate endpoint, uh, the change in the surrogate endpoint actually does lead to a change in the uh, disease state. Um, these state drug review boards, uh, there are there were nine proposed in uh, seven states in 2019. A couple of interesting things. Uh, some of them include clinicians. Three of them include patient representatives. Um, and uh, and one can set a maximum profit margin for manufacturers. Um, so and and growing interest across states in this approach uh, in response to concerns about drug affordability. You know, and then just thinking about evidence in the context of how it is collected, um, and and often cost effectiveness is done using clinical trial data. So just you know a quick snapshot um, progress check. Well, there has been a lot of effort and initiatives, uh, really for decades, to encourage more representation in clinical trials. Of the 53 new drug approvals in 2020, six enrolled uh, people that were uh, at the average um, for Latino uh, and uh, Blacks in the U.S. So um, that's 13% for Blacks and 19% uh, for Latinos. So. The vast majority of trials did not even meet the average representation, um, much less the representation that would be reflected in that disease state. Um, that was only two in 2019. And then for oncology, none of the trials for drugs approved um, that were US-based trials uh, had uh, the people enrolled at the benchmark um, of, of how they're represented in the population. And you know, sort of why does that matter? This is a really simple example, but um, this is the Eagles study, which is a post-market study done in smoking cessation. It was a very big study and enrolled 25% of the participants were Black. Um, and what you see here is the reaction, uh, the efficacy of the drug relative to the placebo was different uh, in the Black enrollees versus the white enrollees. Um, and in fact, if you were to... Um, Considering the efficacy difference, um, basically it means you need to enroll a larger study. So going forward, while there will be continued efforts to make trials more diverse, I think we also have to recognize that that makes the study, can make the study larger and longer. Um, and that is a trade-off that uh, drug companies will need to consider um, as they consider sort of the economics and the timing of doing the trial. And then, you know, we think about some of the incentives that are in place. Um, there's a lot of incentives to get drugs on the market more quickly. Um, that was I think, one of the critiques in the coverage with evidence development decision. Um, and uh, increasingly, and this has been a focus. So are we going to see sort of the brakes been being put on on the reimbursement end while the gas is being stepped on on the regulatory approval end? And, and sort of what does that mean for investment and drug development? So these are some of the questions I'm going to be asking, um, and uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and start off, and then I'll take the slides off. Um, you know, for for both of you and maybe Darius, you'll start. Do you agree with me? Do you think that um, there will be an increasing role for the use of evidence in price setting, centralized price setting in the federal and state government, or do you think this will be kind of like pay for value, where it was a lot of a lot of splash but very slow evolution? Um, I think. Probably, but the bigger issue to me is nobody knows what the heck is going to happen because the the legislation itself is extremely vague about the details of uh, how price setting will take place. Um, there's a third rail in the federal government when it comes to looking at evidence of cost effectiveness and value. And so people try to skirt around that with the notion of comparative effectiveness, but in, inevitably that has to be thought of and a value context. I think the there's a chilling effect on innovation because we don't really know how this 
uh, how evident, what evidence will be used, how it will be used, or whether the path of least resistance will be taken, which is just let's cut the price of the most successful, highest revenue products, which from an economic standpoint is the worst thing that you could do. But in some ways, it's the simplest and um, least uh, politically difficult strategy for the federal government to pursue. Excellent. Amitav, what do you think? Yeah, I want to pick up on where Darius left off. Um, you know, if you look at the IRA, the way it's written, one of the interesting things about it is that when the drug price negotiation starts, there is no floor in the IRA for how low the prices can go. So if you're the United States government and you're using your full negotiating power to get a low price, you will find that the low price that you can extract without using evidence is much lower than the price that you can obtain by using evidence. And given that the budget is really what drives the IRA, that's its sort of you know, principal motivation, or by that, I mean, people just don't wanna to spend too much on drugs. The government, why should the government use any evidence, not even bad evidence? It would just say, I can get an incredibly no, low monopsony price and that's the price that I would like to use. So I worry about the fact that we will be using no evidence at all because there's no floor in the IRA. I think that is in fact the worst case scenario and it's not unlikely because it, you, you can just, just imagine, let's look at the highest revenue drugs. And, and the reason just maybe for clarity, the reason that's such a bad idea is that the economic goal is to align prices with value. So the drugs that are most successful should be rewarded the most. The drugs that are least successful for patients uh, should be rewarded the least. Uh, but using revenue as a marker for price cuts kind of goes in the wrong direction. And it targets drugs that have been taken up by the market. Uh, and that's kind of the opposite of what you want done. That's, that's the real fear, I think, that, that I have about the way this might be implemented. And Amitabh emphasized that point. Excellent. So Amitav, uh, now shifting gears a little bit to coverage with evidence development, sort of apart from this, you know, from, from the, the monoclonal antibodies for Alzheimer's disease, but just sort of thinking broadly about the use of coverage with evidence development for an FDA approved indication. Um, you know, what do you think this means for uh, drug development, for incentives, for innovation? Is this a good use of the power of CMS to collect evidence what are some of the implications for uh, patient access and, and, and the collection of new evidence um, and new drugs, development of new drugs? Mm, there's a lot There's a lot in that question. So I'm gonna pick up a little piece of, of, of it and then uh, maybe we can come back to it. Um, and I know the Dries will have a lot to add to this, but let me just start by saying that something that's a little bit unpopular to say I know the industry is very upset, very, very upset that, you know, CMS made the determination that it did. I think industry's view is this is an FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's. Who are you CMS to not cover the drug? I think that's actually not the right way to think about it because, you know, what will happen with time if we move to a world where the government has to cover every FDA approved drug is, over time, there'll be enormous pressure on the FDA to internalize government's problem on the payment side. And so over time, the FDA will not just be approving safe and effective drugs, it will be also approving safe, effective, and affordable to the United States government. So in the long run, I think it's important to separate the regulatory function of the FDA from the payment function um, of CMS. So the fact to me that CMS, you know, wants to ask for more evidence is not by itself a problem. I realize like all my friends, you know, from the industry are probably very upset right now. But, you know, the other thing I would say is in Medicare Part B, which is where this particular drug is, the Alzheimer's drug, and where a lot of oncology infusion therapies are sitting, the government really doesn't do any negotiation, right? It pays the commercial price plus 6%. And if the drug is disproportionately used 
by Medicare beneficiaries. It's not like the commercial plans have an incentive to negotiate down that price. So the ASP could be very high, government pays the very high ASP, and we are all on the side of what Darius said, which is value-based pricing, but that's not a value price in any way, right? So where I would like us to be is a world in which CMS has deputized payers to negotiate on its behalf, because that would get us the negotiation we want, but get us away from CMS with the millions of covered lives that it represents using its monopsony power to determine price or to determine coverage. Like in some ideal world, if CMS, you know, asked the PBMs or asked the payers to negotiate the price of Alzheimer's drugs or these cancer drugs, I think we'd be in a much better place. And I'm okay with those with those agents of the government coming up with a different decision than the FDA. So the FDA approves the drug and then this payer says, yeah, you know, the drug is approved, but we're only going to cover it in this narrow indication. We're not going to cover it for all these other indications. And if they get the answer wrong, there's going to be some market competition between the payers. So I realized that probably <laughs> that was a lot also uh, on, on, on my side, but I think this is a really important question. It was a big question. So thank you for, uh, Darius, what, what would you like to add? Well, I, I think, um, uh, I'm in agreement with several key points Amitabh made, and I want to use them to launch into another, uh, my own unpopular opinion on this, which is, so So first, I agree that the FDA scope should be restricted as it is today to safety and effectiveness. It should not stray into value. It's not designed for that. And I also agree that uh, just covering everything the FDA approves will place pressure on the FDA. The thing I don't like about CED or coverage with evidence development is the binary nature and the universality of it uh, when it's performed by a government. So when Medicare says we're not covering it uh, until you generate X, Y, and Z data, um, that's a that that is inherently a universalizing decision where some Medicare beneficiaries probably could have benefited from the product, um, and there's no recourse for them because it's not a private market where they could switch. That's the danger we have. I also think just as a brief aside, the, the focus on surrogate endpoints to me is a bit of a, of a specious argument. I mean, there's really a continuum here. Some surrogate endpoints have never been validated, but the FDA accepts them anyway. Others have been validated numerous times. Um, some hard endpoint trials have very few patients in them. And, and there, there are questions about whether they'll generalize to uh, the real world or not. So I don't think it really makes sense to have this hard and fast rule about surrogates versus uh, hard endpoints. The real issue is what's the uncertainty? What's the degree of uncertainty we have uh, when we're launching a drug? It's typically pretty high. And so prices should reflect that uncertainty. And I'm a fan of value-based pricing or prices of just the value. Um, and, and ideally, we'd want this done in a market. Now, to the extent that we we have government intervention, you know, and we, we can't live in the fantasy world where the government is not involved. Now, let me come to my unpopular opinion, which is, I think industry for too long has opposed um, high quality health technology assessment in the U.S. I think in the past, it's been uh, the view has been if we open Pandora's box, all hell will break loose. But the reality is that Pandora's box was going to be opened by somebody who had a very bad idea about how to assess health technologies. And I think that's kind of where we are today, that now it's it, the view is that value is about um, minimizing budget impact, which is not at all what it's supposed to be. Um, and, and I think focusing on if we're going to have administratively set prices, and that's the world we're in, and I'm just being practical about it, even though it might not be my preference then we should have the right way to assess health technology using modern methods rather than you know 30 year old methods that don't reflect the views of patients and I, that is i think a split in the way industry looks at it even insurers aren't necessarily all on board with it but but i think that has to be part of the solution for rational government price setting maybe that's an oxymoron but you know we this is the world we live in today Excellent. Um, so, so you mentioned that you think the argument around surrogate endpoints is a little bit specious and um, 
Well, what do you think? Do you think this decision is going to have an influence on the use of surrogate endpoints for complex diseases that tend to have higher priced drugs? Or do you think people will take this in the context of, of what it is for a particular disease state? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I think it's it what what it probably means is two things. One, there will likely be some chilling effect on the use of surrogate endpoints. Just now, now there's a risk that people didn't really maybe fully appreciate, and now it's a real risk. I think the other th issue is that that uh, it seems inevitable to me that there will be pricing effects. So a drug that comes out with the surrogate endpoint um, evidence is, is maybe going to have a harder time supporting a higher price than a drug that comes out with hard endpoint evidence. Uh, that probably results in more delays getting drugs to patients, which is a cost that is invisible to policymakers typically and therefore ignored. Um, and that's why I think you know this it, the, all of the hand wringing over surrogacy in endpoints, I think is is somewhat one sided. That there are advantages and disadvantages to surrogates. They get drugs to patients faster. On the other hand, they inject a lot of uncertainty into the process. But let's quantify the uncertainty. Let's figure out what that means for uh, value-based pricing. Um, and let's use the evidence we have to get patients the care that is most likely to improve outcomes. If we waited for perfect certainty, a lot of people are going to die prematurely. But the problem is no one's counting those deaths. Um, at the FDA or at CMS, unfortunately, but they need those, those premature deaths should be avoided, and all of those patients need need their voices heard. Thank you. So, on the top now, switching back to the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the, especially particularly the uh, the maximum fair price setting provision. Um, what's not being talked about, uh, particularly as we consider how evidence will be used um, and, and just the process of setting price? Right. So I think, you know, one of the things that um, there are a lot of things in the IRA that are not being talked about. So let me just start with something very positive. Um, I do like the fact that the IRA reduces patient out of pocket in Medicare Part D and caps it at $2,000. I like it a lot. $2,000 is still a lot of money for the typical Medicare beneficiary, but I think this is a step in the right direction because I think there's growing evidence, actually starting with um, you know, Dana Goldman and Jeff Joyce's work on how cost sharing can be damaging to patients with chronic disease. Um, and I think a lot of that work, which is now about 15 years old, has, has really kind of, it has, it has been tested, it has been stress tested. And I think now we can, for the first time, start to see the mortality effects of caution. People don't always know what to cut back on, they cut back haphazardly. What is not being talked about in the IRA is that there's still a lot of cost sharing in Medicare Part B. I mean, in traditional Medicare, and even the Medicare Advantage plans follow traditional Medicare here, the coinsurance rates are 20%. With no cap, there's no out-of-pocket max. So if I need a $300,000 drug and I'm paying 20%, that is going to be $60,000 a year. But the typical Medicare beneficiary's income is $27,000 a year. So Medicare Part B is just like a broken, kind of lousy insurance offering that the government offers the public. And I think, you know, if we're talking about something more general, if we're talking about the financial toxicity of very expensive drugs, Medicare Part B is, a, you know, making that look like an insurance program seems like something we should be talking about. But here's the big thing about the IRA that I don't think I understand the answer to. If we remove cost sharing, which is what we've done in Part D with the IRA, then what's the lever? that health plans have to negotiate prices. So, you know, prior to the IRA, they would use cost sharing, they would use tiering, they would use formularies, but now they can't use that tool. So what tool are they going to use? They're probably going to use utilization management tools like prior authorization and step therapy. And I don't know <laughs> which is the better tool. Maybe cost sharing has its problems, and but maybe prior authorization and utilization management have larger problems. I don't know. Maybe they have fewer problems, but that is the question that I would like to know the answer to. And it is possible that patients really don't want to wait 
for all of that utilization management and step therapy to, to play itself out. So I think we've made an assumption here that by getting rid of cost sharing, we've made life easy for patients. We might have, I think we have, but but now this other this other device will rear its ugly head. And I don't know how patients will react to that. And I don't know how patients will be affected by that. Darius, what's your view? What are we not talking about in particular as it as it gets to sort of getting getting the value for our, the money we spend on the medicines in, in Medicare? Well, so Amitav very graciously, I think, gave a lot of credit to Dana Goldman and Jeff Joyce for all their work on cost sharing. And, and Amitav himself has advanced that literature considerably. I want to give credit to another one of my colleagues. We have lots of great people at USC uh, who I learn from every day. And Aaron Trish has pointed out um, that one of the hidden effects of the IRA could be that it makes formularies kind of disappear. So maybe even utilization management is difficult to achieve. And the issue is that currently in the coverage gap phase, uh, Part D insurers are reluctant, in fact, very often don't use formularies because it compromises their ability to receive manufacturer rebate payments. It changes the basis on which those rebate payments are calculated. So now that we're kind of, in a sense, expanding the scope of the manufacturer rebate payments, one of the implications of that might be that you don't have, that it just doesn't make sense for there to be formularies. And I think it just makes Amitabh's question even more salient, which is, okay, well, you don't have cost sharing. Maybe you, there's a strong penalty for the use of formularies and utilization management. Now what? And I think it, it still comes back to, you know, what I said earlier, which is very unpopular, which is maybe there's no way around um, figuring out uh, a strategy for health technology assessment that is going to be patient centered. And, you know, that is a longer discussion, but I don't know where else we have to go at this point, honestly, because given those constraints, now we can certainly contemplate reforms where uh, these where formularies might be useful, where there could be negotiating leverage restored. And, and that's a good discussion to have, right? But I think we should also understand what kind of world will we live in without those reforms and what will end up happening. Thank you. So to follow on to your point, Darius, about, uh, you know, sort of patient benefit from HTA or, or patient-centric HTA, you know, there is a ban on the use of qualities uh, by the federal government that comes from the Affordable Care Act. And then furthermore, the IRA kind of followed on with that by saying, you know, the government can't consider uh, sort of a vulnerable or, or, or very sick population or old population to be of less value. Are those patient protections? And, and what do you think that means for how evidence will be considered and how price will be set? Yeah, so I, I, you know, we should accept the blame as economists for having promulgated flawed cost effectiveness for many years, in, in my opinion. I think, you know, that we, we see that HTA bodies are, have been reluctant to use cost effectiveness on vulnerable, severely ill, disabled patient populations. Even the UK has carved out exceptions. But economists too often, in my view, said, well, you know, that's just because, uh, people don't understand economics and therefore they're doing the wrong thing. But I think the, the right answer was economists didn't understand people in that scenario, that we, did, we hadn't figured out that the value of improving health is actually greater when people have less health, which is crazy because that's the first thing you teach freshmen uh, economic students is this idea of diminishing returns, that somebody who has less of something will place more value on more of it. So I think those kinds of, of improvements to um, cost effectiveness are long overdue. We should have been banned. Like that is, as a profession, you know, our, our methods should have been banned the way they were constructed. I think we know how to fix those problems now. And I think we've got a lot of repair work to do with uh, patient groups and others who have correctly criticized the way cost effectiveness has been formulated. And that's a big focus of you know, the work that I do in outreach to patient groups and, and advocates for patients with disability. Um, and, and we've got work to do on our end. And my hope is that that will be successful and we can bring modern tools of health technology assessment to bear so we don't end up in this really bad outcome where the successful drugs are the ones that keep taking it on the chin, which is, as I said, the, the, the opposite of the right solution. 
Amos, how what would you add? Are the prote patient protections that are in the laws sufficient? Um, what what protections do they really give patients? And, and so, so you know, I, I was going to just mention that when you're doing health technology assessment um, well, even when you're doing it badly, you need to kind of count up the value of the medicine. So some people just count up the quality value from a medicine. And I think what Darius is saying is that medicines generate value in lots of ways that go beyond qualities, right? And so we need, we have a better understanding of what those ways are, and we can do a better job of calculating that. But that's not enough. Once you've summed the benefit of a medicine to the patient, to society, you have to multiply that benefit by some dollar figure, right? And you could be very careful in how you measured the benefit. And then you could multiply it by too little of a dollar figure just to be cheap, right? And so in other words, you could say, you know, people only value this excellent year of life, this perfect year of life at $30,000 when all of the empirical work would suggest that that number is, you know, closer to one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000. So to do HDA well, you need to measure value completely, but you also have to monetize that value consistently. And so there's that second piece of it that I think like the UK illustrates, not only do they rely on qualities, but then they take their meager notion of qualities and multiply it by $30,000 per quality, which is it's like a sort of a double penalty. And so to do all of this properly, I think we have to have a much clearer sense of what society is willing to pay for, you know, excellent transformational improvements in functioning and use that number and not just reduce that number when it runs into budgetary problems. You know, I think that's a really important point, Kirsten, that Amitabh just made. And I, I think there, there's some implications of it. So the value of health is something that can be answered with evidence not just uh, you know, a bunch of people sitting around a room and offering opinions. It's as if we all sat down and said, what are consumers willing to pay for bananas? And the solution we came up with is to have six economists sit in a room and opine on what consumers are willing to pay for bananas. That's, that's clearly not the right way to do it. You go and do research and figure out what consumers are willing to pay. And we know how to do that with health, uh, but I, I think Amitabh is exactly right that people view it as a subjective question. In economics, it's not. It's how much will you exchange, how much money will you exchange for health? And we can adjust that for budgets and do a lot of sophisticated things, but ultimately it needs to be evidence-based. Otherwise it becomes, uh, it defeats the purpose of performing health technology assessment when the value is itself not evidence-based. Now, thinking about what evidence is used, I think we've all been part of or, or attended uh, millions of conferences in the last 10 years talking about real world evidence and how it's going to change healthcare. Um, but yet in this CED decision, you know, the, 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 the default was enrolled in a clinical trial. It's unclear what clinical value will mean in the IRA, uh, whether that will be only clinical trial data or real world evidence. Um, you know, how, how do you think this will play out? Do you see a way that the uh, IRA and the way value is assessed could really foster the development of high quality real world evidence? Or do you think that will be, you know, kind of kind of in scope? Uh, maybe I'll start with Darius on this one. Um, well, you know, I, I had long hoped that uh, that real world evidence would take more of a a prominent place in the way we think about the value of drugs. Um, everybody understands the limitations of real world evidence. I think too few people understand and appreciate the limitations of trial data and the fact that you need both to figure out what a drug is going to do in the real world. Um, I think that it's probably, maybe it's unfair to say that uh, people haven't been trying to, an industry has certainly has been trying to bring real world evidence to bear. I think the FDA has been reluctant to incorporate real world evidence into approval decisions. And maybe that's okay for what the FDA is trying to do. Uh, we can debate that point. I don't have a strong opinion there. I do think that real world evidence needs to be part of the discussion around value for sure. Because the question is ultimately, what is the drug doing 
in real world practice, what value is it creating? So I would hope that prices, if they're set administratively, should be aim should be aligned with real world value, not some kind of theoretical value based on the trial performance and some heavily modeled outcome. We have to appreciate the uncertainty in the data, use state of the art methods, and figure out you know, what's our best guess at real world effectiveness. And, and my hope is that this will be uh, a stimulant to a move in that direction, which I think is long overdue. Amitabh, what's your view? I mean, I think, look, I think the need for real world evidence is actually colossal and it extends beyond just the world of medicines. Like suppose we were talking about you know, a drug that was helping the functioning of the elderly, maybe the FDA approves it as being safe and effective, because it is, but maybe it's still less effective than a meaningful long-term care worker coming to your house and helping you shower and, you know, uh, change your bandages and things like that. I would like to know that because it means that in the real world, the drug is actually less effective than what we found in the clinical trials. Now, I could give you lots of examples where the real world evidence is much larger because maybe we did the trial in very sick patients because it was a brand new, you know, brand new technology. No one was willing to allow the manufacturer to experiment in relatively healthy patients. They had to do the trial in very sick patients. But then in the real world, we found it does even better when used in healthier patients, maybe because they can tolerate the drug better. So there are so many reasons why we need real world evidence. Uh, I too, like the RIAS, don't have a view on how well equipped the FDA is to do drug approvals based on real world evidence. I sort of want to kind of just make sure that the drug is effective and safe, effective in the indication that the manufacturer sought out and then let you know, real world evidence collected by payers figured this out. But now here's the part that I'm, again, maybe a little bit grumpy about. While I'm skeptical of government's ability to collect real world evidence and act on it, and I tend to be much more optimistic about the ability of private payers to do this, Every time the private payers have been tested, it's not like they've papered themselves in glory. It's not like the private payer industry. It could have on its own been collecting a lot of this real world evidence. If you look at what private payers have done, I mean, look, they have very high co-payments on things like insulin. Why? You don't need a lot of real world evidence to know that nobody's overusing their insulin. They have a lot of co-insurance on rare gene therapies. Like who are the patients who are overusing a gene therapy? So, you know, it is possible that the right answer is, you know, that the payers have to sort of be regulated to collect. You can't tell them what to collect, but you have to mandate some kind of transparency onto them. And you have to say, when you build a formula, or when you do utilization management, you have to be very transparent on your websites on how you made those determinations. You can't just say this was off the formulary, this is a tier four drug. You have to tell us what calculus, what data you use to make that determination. And that might be you know, some combination of private payers making these decisions, but some regulatory action that forces transparency on them. Because I don't think they're very transparent right now at all. So I'm going to put my first question from the audience to Amitabh first. Um, and the question is, who is doing high quality HGA? It seems like um, most organizations that are at least sharing their HGA are using sort of assumption-based clinical trial data-driven spreadsheet type models with a budgetary restriction. Are, and it could be inside or outside of the U.S. Who do you think is doing high quality HGA? I think some of the private plans are thinking about doing HGA a lot better than than, than others. I don't know if anyone has really embraced, like when I think about what is high quality HTA, I go back to a paper that Darius was responsible for writing, right? Like you have this ISPOR value flower that articulates all the notions of value that are much richer than just totaling up the qualities that a drug may generate. And so one question I have for Darius is, you know, who's at the frontier of quantifying the various petals and the value flower, because that would be the answer to the question that you just asked me. Doris, what do you think? Well, I think um, 
uh, I think we have the methods to conduct high quality HTA. Honestly, I think it's a question of incentives. I, I don't think the issue is that uh, people are negligent. You know, it's just that, right, the, who does HTA now? Well, the manufacturers do and the payers do. And both of them clearly have a stake in the outcome, very different stakes and, and, and different kinds of goals for the HTA. A, a government payer, if anything, uh, ought to have the right incentives for conducting high quality HTA. The problem, which I think is well understood, is you want the, the process of HTA and government to be insulated from the government's own fiscal incentives. So for example, I think it would be a really bad idea for CMS to be in charge of health technology assessment, which is maybe where we end up headed. But, but the problem with that is we just replicate the incentives to contain costs. That's not what you want. You want something more like the Federal Reserve model. You want some independent body that is conducting health technology assessment representing the interests both of future generations of patients, current patients and payers, because that's all embedded in getting value right. So to me, the methods are here, but we have to create the institutions that have a stake and an interest in uh, conducting high value HTA. Um, I think private uh, bodies can also be doing it, by the way, I don't wanna dismiss that. And I think more support for HTA in areas where there isn't um, intellectual property to uh, kind of create an incentive for the performance of those health technology assessments is a role for government where they can foster the creation of good HTA in uh, the private sector. And I think over time, uh, private industry will follow the lead of uh, an independent government HTA process. Um, just the, the influence and the methodology will, I think, uh, demonstrate the value to patients. That's that's my hope, at least, that, and that's how how this gets all all gets resolved. But to me, it's more about institutions than it is about science right now. So, just to follow up on that question, and this gets a bit to the states having increasing interest in doing this. Do you think there should be a high quality HGA organization setting the price for drugs in the US or there should be high quality HGA organizations setting the price? Um, should there be should this be something where you have multiple uh, entities producing evidence, possibly from different patient perspectives, um, even though that will lead to a greater uh, band of pricing? Does do we end up in a different spot? That's for drugs. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not a fan of one party solutions in general um, for a lot of reasons. And I, I think, so a couple of issues, I, I think I, I certainly support having multiple uh, organizations and entities involved in health technology assessment uh, because otherwise it gets, it's subject to group think. HTA is still hard, you know, like there's no question about it. It's hard to do health technology assessment. So you need to see people making different decisions and you should be able to evaluate who seemed to get things right, who seemed to get things wrong. Uh, and that kind of intellectual competition leads to better science. I mean, it's, it's the model of academia. You know, that's the reason we don't have a single person writing a bunch of studies. And we instead have an, uh, an exchange of ideas. So I think that's important. I also don't like the idea in general of consolidating HTA with uh, payment, right? That, that's the incentive problem. I mentioned earlier, you don't want payers conducting high stakes HTA. You want that process to be separate and as insulated as possible. Maybe there's no such thing as independence in today's government. I don't know, but you want it to be as an in independent and insulated a process as possible. You want it to be decentralized so people can learn and that uh, mistakes can be pointed out. Otherwise, mistakes are invisible and they just perpetuate themselves. Wonderful. And Amitabh, sort of a spin on that question to you, and I'd be interested in HGA organization versus organizations, but what are the skill sets you would bring to a high quality HGA organization? Is it all the health economists? Are there other uh, disciplines that you would see in that? Um, and I'm being glib, it's never just the health economists. Are there other disciplines that you would see in a high quality HGA organization? Yeah. So first of all, I, I want multiple people to do it, right? And the reason I want multiple people to do it is because um, 
we don't exactly, the rise race is the first order problem, which is that you don't want government to do it and you don't want a single private entity to do it either. You want entities to do it in a way that if one of them were to get it wrong, patients would say, I don't want coverage. I don't want my formulary or I don't want the drugs that I have access to be determined by this particular entity. You know, the entity that Chandra runs is a terrible entity. The one that Axelson runs seems to be getting it right for patients like me. So I want to be covered by a health plan that uses the Axelson formulary as opposed to the Chandra formulary. So you could, you, you could still have plans doing their own HTA. You don't need every plan doing their own HTA. You could have three or four competing HTA agencies and each plan basically says, this is the one that we use. So it's very clear to the patient which one, which one they use. So that's the world that I would like um, to, 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 to get us to. Um, what was the second part of your question? Oh, what, are, what are the disciplines you would bring to a, a high quality HG organization? You know, I think there, my, my view is that we have not done in economics a very good job of understanding the patient perspective on a lot of these drugs, right? Like we tend, we've thought forever that you can boil the value of the drug down to the quality from the drug, plus maybe social savings, you know, which is easy. Who would dispute that? Like if the drug saves money, of course you should cover the drug. So that's not a particularly deep insight. But I don't think we have a good sense, for example, of how some of the value of a CF drug might not just be an improved lung functioning, it might be in allowing a CF patient to experience marriage, to experience the birth of a child, or the value of an Alzheimer's drug is not just the improvement in cognition, but the ability to recognize and speak to a grandchild, right? Those are things that are all measurable, but like we need someone to tell us that. So the HD agency of the future is gonna to need to be quite close to patients and would probably need ethicists who are able to point out to the agency that they might be missing voices um, in the evidence generation. So you let me connect it back to your opening fact about the degree to which clinical trials are unbalanced. You know, the fact that they're unbalanced is not by itself a problem. The problem is that it's be, they, when they're unbalanced, maybe doctors say, mm, I don't have to really prescribe this drug for African-American patients because they were not really in the study. Maybe the drug doesn't work for them. And so you would need this HTA agency of the future to be aware a lot about how doctors prescribe medicines as well. Again, that would require perspective from a prescribing doctor who would be different than an accountant, who would be different than a statistician and would be different than an economist. Thank you. So I'm gonna pose this next question from the audience to Darius, because you had mentioned going after the biggest drug is possibly you know, the worst way uh, the price setting could have been implemented. The question from the audience is, but aren't the way prices are set today so bad that anything the IRA would do is going to be better than status quo? Um, well, I don't know how to evaluate the way prices are set today, because in part, we haven't actually done the work to uh, figure out value for every drug in uh, a, a, what I would say is a rigorous and defensible manner. So I don't know. I, that that I guess I, I, I would uh, say we need more evidence to figure out if that's if that pre if the premise is correct or not. Um, my suspicion is that uh, the market doesn't do uh, uh, a terrible job of aligning prices with value. I, I'm sure there are errors. Uh, there definitely are some drugs that are rewarded more when they're not producing more value. Uh, but I'm not so sure that in the large that um, the drugs that are successful are in fact not helping patients. That's harder to, to imagine, but you know, it's an empirical question and we need to figure out the uh, empirical evidence. And that's you know, my colleague, Chuck Phelps, who's um, an esteemed health economist has you know, made the point that uh, until we know how uh, 
our existing catalog of drugs does with high quality evidence on value, high quality health technology assessment, we won't know whether we've been getting it right or wrong. And until we know that, it's actually hard to figure out exactly how to reform the system. So that to me is a, is a priority number one of figuring out how to measure value in the back catalog, so to speak. And a, a, a line, to what extent is that aligned with value or not? Thank you. Amitab, a final question for you. And again, this comes from the audience. CMS has billions to implement uh, the price setting uh, processes in the IRA. How do you see this affecting um, supply of people and organizations who are doing health technology assessments? Are your students going to be more interested in going to this field? Do you think there'll be more sort of cottage industry in HTA? Um, or do you think, you know, conversely, the government will sort of crowd out um, the development of private uh, HTA organizations? Yeah, it's kind of interesting how CMS always has $3 billion to implement the IRA, but not $3 billion to pay for a drug. Like, that's always, like, an amazing fact to me is that, like, we have lots of money to hire people, but, like, not a lot of money to pay for drugs. Look, I don't understand why CMS needs $3 billion to implement the IRA unless CMS is peering into the future and believes that, it, that the future Congress might expand the IRA. Because if I look at the IRA as written, CMS has to negotiate the prices of, you know, 10 to 20, 25 drugs. And if you look at an agency that does HTA in the United States right now, like ICER, <laughs> they don't have a $3 billion budget. They're not hiring as many people as CMS is hiring. And they put out, you know, guidance on drugs, um, many more drugs than 10 to 25. So I don't really understand why CMS is building this army of health technology assessors unless it is uniquely inefficient or it believes that in the future it's going to be negotiating the prices of many more drugs. And this brings us full circle because in many ways, the real threat of the IRA is not the current version of the IRA. It's the future version of the IRA where, you know, the government comes along and says today it was 10 drugs or 20 drugs and tomorrow it could be 200 drugs or tomorrow it could be all launch prices. And that is a whole other level of uncertainty for the industry because what you want is a world in which the industry knows where the goalposts are. We can set that goalpost on value. These, this is the evidence you need to demonstrate to have your drug approved and paid for. But if we're changing that evidence for whatever reason, that becomes like, you know, kind of the kind of uncertainty that the industry really cannot grapple with. And so when I see the CMS, uh, you know, with its $3 billion hiring all of these people, hiring all of these contractors, I worry that that's the world that CMS is gearing up for. And that does not make me optimistic at all. Idris, do you have anything to add there? Are you students going to, going to be more motivated to do a health technology assessment? Well, uh, they're already pretty motivated to do health technology assessment, but I think, like Amitabh, I don't know what what where the three billion dollars goes. I think you know the just kind of uh, uh, fleshing out where where Amitabh left off. I think the question is, what do we do given all the uncertainty we face about how this policy is going to get implemented, uh, and that it could there could be an army of HTA uh, staff that is ready for a pivot. Uh, of, of this legislation. I think industry has to commit to figuring out how to measure value in a credible way, understanding the uncertainty and the value of, of the real world effectiveness of their drugs. Academics like us have to commit to ensuring that the valuation of medical technology is aligned with the uh, needs of patients and the preferences of patients. Um, and it's going to take a lot of disciplines, you know, as noted, psychologists, sociologists, economists, ethicists, philosophers. It's, it's going to take a village to do that scientifically. And then it needs to be implemented by payers and industry so we can figure out what value is going to mean. Um, and then we'll be prepared for various eventualities. It is a little scary because we don't know what's going to happen one way or the other. Hopefully, we'll get a good outcome. Uh, but I think that's far from clear. Um, and as to how this law will evolve. 
Thank you both so much. This was a great discussion. I hope everyone watching it enjoyed it as much as I did. And I'm really grateful for your time and your insights today. Thank, Thank you, so you Kirsten. Great to see you, Darius. See you, Amitabh. Always great to chat.